those are all our, those are all our instructors anyway. Okay. Oops. Let's move on. Whoops. Okay. I think um, I think uh, this was already added to the chat. So all the material. So there's a there's a folder that has each our each session five sessions today. Okay. So you'll find a whole bunch of material. Some of the material in my section I won't be using, but it's just there for reference if you need it. Okay. Um. So the other important thing about that about that drive, in fact, let me go to that drive here now. So this is what the drive looks like when you can see it. So we have sessions one, two, three, four, and five. Um, we're currently in session one, which is this bit here. I'll be coming going through some of these files. Um, but of interest are the cheat sheets. Um, so the cheat sheets are a bunch of uh, uh, PDFs and so on on quick information on the software we use. And if you've not used Python, there's some quick sheets on how to use Python. And then there's another uh, PowerPoint set, set of PowerPoint slides on, on using our software, but we'll be going through all this anyway. Okay, so that's the cheat sheet folder. Um, so where's my, let me go back to here. Okay, so we have things like Telurium in a nutshell, uh, a folder for each section, and then there's any scripts, PowerPoints, or exercises will be in the um, in the folders as well. Okay, and then um, we'll be using um, Telurium today. I'll have a lot more to say about Telurium shortly. Um, this is our Python platform that we use. There's a couple of main tools in the, that are available in this domain. Telurium is one of them. And there's a, a link to the documentation, but I'll go over more of this later um, and how to use Tellurium. Okay, so the this is what we're going to do today. Uh, these are basically the topics. Now, um, I don't know how familiar you all are with Python. So I'm gonna have a quick run, or run through the most important parts of Python, only enough to get you going, right? It's not gonna be a full Python course because that would be too much but just some basic stuff. And the nice thing about Python is you only know, I have to know a little bit and you can do a lot. It's not like C or C++ or even Java or something like that, where you have to really know quite a bit to make any progress. Nice thing about Python is you only know, I have to know a little bit and you can already, you know, be do useful things with it. Okay, so we're gonna have a little intro to Python and then we're gonna have an intro to biochemical modeling and our software. So that'll occupy the first hour. Um, and then Michael's going to come on and mainly Michael is going to talk about uh, Michaelis Menton Kinetics and he'll have some uh, exercises there for you to do. And then at 11 o'clock, maybe we'll have a break at that point, five minutes or something. Um, but then we'll move on 11 o'clock to parameter fitting. Then there's lunch, although lunch, depending on where you are in the world, may not be lunch. Uh, and then one o'clock, Lucian comes in and Jen to do something on biomodels and the standards. This is very important for us uh, so that you can exchange models between different tools so you're not reliant on one tool. Then I'm going to do a special session on metabolic control analysis, which is a really important um, approach to understanding metabolism. Um, I'm only going to give you a little introduction, um, but it's sort of, uh, I mean, it's, it's very popular in Europe and it's starting to become of more interest in the US. Um, anyway, it's a way of understanding metabolism that you don't get from just simulation. And then at the end, we have any questions or projects that you're doing, you want somebody to give you a hand to go over what you're doing and so on. Uh, that could be pretty much anything you want to do. Uh, that's at three o'clock, out that specific time, three o'clock. Okay. All right. Um, so um, maybe before I go on, do you have any questions from our participants? You just want to say hello. So I think you're from all over the place, right? I think we have some US people and probably some other people from elsewhere. All right, that's great. Um, okay, so let's guess we could get started then. So, um, but if there's any questions, just put them into the chat. Uh, people will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, clarifications, people can answer you uh, in the chat channel, okay? Um, all right, 
software. Okay, so this is how day is all about building computer models of cellular processes. And, you know, there are quite a few of those. There's metabolism, there's signaling networks, there's gene regulatory networks, and there's probably a host of other things too. We're going to focus today mainly on reaction networks and with some emphasis on metabolism. Okay. Uh, now, in order to build, you know, models, you can do a number of things. You can derive the math yourself, which in this case would be differential equations, and type them into something like MATLAB or whatever your favorite tool is, and then uh, ask the program to solve the equations and you get your plots. So that's one way. And, you know, I started off doing that. And the problem with that is it's very easy to make mistakes, uh, especially if the model is big. You just have a bunch of differential equations, really hard to read. And, you, you know, mistakes are very easy to introduce. The other problem is once it's in that form, it's difficult now to hand it over to somebody else. Uh, say, let's say you did your model in MATLAB, but they're doing their thing in Julia or or, in, or even something like, you know, Java or C or whatever. They're going to have to translate that model by hand into their whatever platform they're using. And that can introduce lots of errors as well. And so very early on, in fact, really are really are early on in history, all the way back to the 1960s. In fact, people started writing specialized software that helped you create these models um, in a sort of error free in, in an error free format. And then later on in around 2000, you know, we developed the standard SBML, which you'll hear more about later on, which now doesn't tie you to any particular platform, but you can move your model, you know, from, from our tool to Copazi to vCell to iBiosim to any other tool that happens to support um, SBML. And there's a lot of tools that support SBML, including in fact, MATLAB. So you're not stuck. And one of the problems with academic software is of course it tends to come and go um, you know, somebody starts, somebody develops a piece of software and then they get a new job and then the software no longer gets developed and then it's it's basically lost. Um, so the idea of being able to exchange your models between tools protects you from that, okay? And so we have models from the early 2000s that I can still run today, okay? Because they're in, uh, in a, an exchange format. Okay. Um, Oops, I can see a typo there. Let me just fix that typo. Oops, come on. Python tool, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so what we're gonna do today, um, we're gonna use a Python tool. I mean, Python is really, really popular at the moment. It's probably one of the most popular languages in the world today, uh, mainly because it's so easy to use. We have this tool built on top of Python, um, was part of Python called Tellurium. Um, and there's another typo. I obviously haven't checked this uh, slide very well. Uh, nice thing about Python is you can run Python either from your desktop uh, or you can run it from the web. And if you really want to, you can even run it from a tablet or your iPhone, but I don't recommend it. But uh, you can run it from the desktop or the web. Now, I, I run it all the time from the desktop, all right? Because that's, that's I have the full power of my desktop machine at my disposal. But uh, some people like to use the web. Nice thing about the web is you can log into any computer and just keep, you know, carry on working if it's on the web. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, I'll explain a little bit how you can use it on the desktop if you want. But to, for today, we're gonna use something called Col Colab. This is Google's, interface to Python on the web. Uh, it uses something called a Jupyter Notebook, which I'll show you shortly. Um, this means that we pretty much don't have to, there's no, there isn't much fiddling with installing stuff on a computer. I mean, all of you have got different computers, Windows, Mac, Linux, or whatever. Now we can install our, pla our Tellurium on any of these, but it takes a bit, of more, bit more effort than just, you know, running it straight from the web. So we're gonna be, to avoid that, any issues, especially since we've only got six hours, we're going to run everything from Colab, which is, you know, convenient. Okay. All right. Now, if you did want to run it from the desktop, there's a whole bunch of, um, I'll show you some of these now, actually. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, 
environment python environments you can use um depending on your preference um spider is one i happen to use if i click on that it takes me to this is what spider looks like it looks very you know flashy and colorful uh i'll show i'll give you a quick demo of that as well so we have a really nice installer for this for windows that gives you everything in in one in one installation so it makes it quite easy to use um but you can use this on the mac as well or linux uh so spider um i know michael uses pycharm this is from jetbrains.com uh those of you who use visual studio code i you know i know some people who use our tools on visual studio code that's pretty nice and i came across the other day something called thorny so Th oh, thorny thorny not thorny thorny um what's interesting about this little tool it works on any platform um but it's completely self-contained so if you were to try to go for spider on its own without using our installer you'd have to install python first then you have to install spider and it's a little bit fiddly that's one reason why we provide our own installers because it, it avoids that but if you didn't use that our installer it's a little bit fiddly um so i came across this thony which actually is um completely self-contained so when i do a download for example it tells me here i can download uh the entire thing with python which is really nice actually you just install this and you can start working straight away uh so if you like working on the desktop you can either use this thony for some reason i always thought it was thony but thony um or you can use our i'll show you where our installers are or you can use the installer for spider okay um all right so what are we going to do now then uh, any questions i know we're jumping into the deep end here but um i'll show you some of these things in a minute all right we're good all right, so the first thing to do is to introduce Python. So I'm going to introduce pretty basic Python. Um, let's go to session one, and I have it here, intro to Python. Okay. So what I just did then, I double-clicked on that, um, that file, and it took me straight to Colab. This is Google's environment for running Python. Okay. Uh, it's very convenient. Um, it has this thing called a notebook. So if, you, if you've if you used something like Mathematica, you're probably familiar with this, but some of you may be familiar with this idea of a notebook. It's almost like a, a document. So, um, although I don't use it like a document here, but it's made up of cells. So here's one cell here, and there's some bunch of cells underneath. Each cell contains some code that you can run. I mean, in principle, you could have just one giant cell, um but a lot of people like to break up their their work into these different cells i'm not a particularly fan of that so certain things you have to watch out for um okay so that's 2003 i thought it updated that um so let's start by looking at some basic python um syntax so the first thing i've got here is uh print so Hold on for a minute. It takes a little bit to start up. Okay, once it's started up, it's it's okay. So maybe let me see if I can zoom in a bit. Maybe show you. There you go. That might be better. So um, what you have here, I have a bunch of um uh, of menu items, things like uh, a new. I could create a new notebook. Let's just do that for the hell of it, shall we? So if I create a new notebook, basically starts me off with an empty notebook. Okay. So I get a basically an empty notebook and I can do that thing here, print hello class. Now, how do I make this run? There's two ways you can do it. You can either click the black button here or you go to the end and then hit shift enter. And if you're not used to that, that can be a bit weird to do. Um, so if you want, you can just click the black button. It'll take a few moments to start up this new notebook. And there it goes and then it prints out hello class okay so that's pretty straightforward all right um and the menu also got the usual editing things and and so on okay all right so um this is going to give you a very basic basic uh intro to python okay so 
let's move from cell to cell. Okay, and I'll show you what we've got. So the first thing is uh, notebooks are made of made from cells, and this is an example of a cell. Okay, and this cell actually contains a comment. Right, so this comment, uh, uh, like all comments, doesn't do anything. It's just a piece of text for you to remind you what's going on. Okay, so if you go to the third um, cell. It also has a comment. It says this is a comment. It's not executed. Then it has a print. So if I run this, all I get is you know some more stuff. Okay, and as it says here in the in the fourth cell, cells can be executed using Shift Enter or the black button on the left. Okay, all right. Um, help is always you know you'll get stuck and you'll need help. Well, Google right is the big the big helper. Maybe these days, actually, I should say, I should add, uh, I bet you're going to guess what I'm going to add. Let me add a new, let me add a new comment. Um, today, or in 2023, you might also ask chat GPT, of course. Okay. So, in fact, chat, uh, chat GTP turns out to know about Tellurium, in fact. In fact, you can ask it to write models uh, in our Tellurium package and it'll write it'll write them so uh, that's interesting okay so anyway google stack overflow is a big uh a forum for get, asking questions and getting help and there are, well must be hundreds of thousands of questions on there now on all, all sorts of topics but there's a lot on python so i'd use stack overflow for python google for python and Tellurium and then chat gdp for python and Tellurium Okay. All right. Now, um, like every uh, computer programming language, it has its ability to manipulate data. And this data, uh, there's various types of this data. And I'm going to list you the only ones you really need to know about uh, for this session. That is uh, integers or whole numbers, uh, floating point numbers. Okay. So I can, once I have these assigned, I can do simple arithmetic. So um, these are the variable names on the left. Um, Python has a very nice uh, list type where you can just have lists of things. I'll, I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Um, and then you can print all these out. So let's let's actually try some. Um, let's create a new. Uh, let me see. Let me move this over here. Uh, let's see. How do we create a new cell? Got not a great new cell. Actually, I don't use this too often. Get the plus code button in the just below that. Oh, 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 there you go. oh here, yeah, yeah, code, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can get it from here. No. Okay. After the yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. So if I, you know, set set i to a number. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, set j to another number. Then I can print out. That's this is really, you know, simple stuff. Okay, and I'm using uh, shift enter here. But what I want to show you are the lists. So you have a list, so a list, let's say. I can have whatever I like in here. I can have, you know, floating point numbers. The other thing I haven't mentioned down here is the idea of a string, right? You saw that when I was printing, print, using the print message, okay? So that's now a list, and then I can ask it to print that list. Oops. And, and also uh, put variables into the list. You can put I or oh, J yeah. into that list. Yeah. That is absolutely right. Yeah, I can do I and J here. Yeah. And if I, I can go I times J if I want. And then I get uh, 5 and 7, 35. So lists are really, really useful. And um, one other thing, I guess, just to finish off, I can I can have nested lists as well. Okay. So we'll use lists a little bit um, in this course. Um, not too much, but it's good good to be aware of them. Okay. Um, all right. So that's those are the basic data types that you need to know. So integers, floats, and strings, which I never mentioned here, but I should probably a string. This is a string. Okay. All right. So and then I can also print out a a string. Okay. So if I run that, now I get the string down here. This is a string. Those are basically pretty much almost the only ones you need for today. There are a couple others like true and false, uh, Boolean. I guess I could I could mention that just to finish it off. Um, uh, is it sunny? And then I can say that either true or, or false. Okay. One thing you notice here, this little thing popped up. Is a really um, 
a lot of Python environments can give you a lot of help. So I went, is it sunny? And I just started, I just put the letter T and it immediately came up with possibilities. And of course the one I want is true. This will happen a lot. Uh, you can, that, that little pop-up will come up. It's especially useful to, for Tellurium when you want to look for a method uh, and it'll help you find it, okay? We have the usual uh, operators, addition, subtraction, and so on. The one that you may that may be a little bit unusual is the power operator, which is two stars or two asterisks. Okay, so if I run this, I get eight. So two to the power of three is eight, of course. This is more about printing. The nice thing about printing, you can just add lots of things to the print statements, separated by commas, and it'll print them all out. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, variable names. I mean, up here, I was using some really simple ones because we don't recommend that. Uh, you, you need to use something that's more meaningful, like, is it sunny? Uh, so down here, I've got, you know, my number, my string, my Boolean. You might want to think of better ones than those variable names, but it's always a good idea to have descriptive variable names. Um, so these are various operations you can do. One thing to note is that variable names are case sensitive. That for people who come to programming the first time, this can be a bit strange uh, because it means that if you had a variable called glucose and you had another one called glucose with a little g, they are completely different. Okay, so you have to be aware of that. Um, what happens if you want to do some math? Um, let me add a code. Let me add a, a new code here. So use math. Uh, let's say I want to do sine. You know, sine of. Uh, or something, these are in radians, okay? So I'm gonna do sign of something, this won't work. If I do this, I get an error. Name sign is not defined, okay? Or log or whatever you want to do. In order to make this work, you have to import the math library. And this is an important piece we'll be doing. The import statement is something you need to know about. Python, one of the other advantages of Python, is got thousands upon thousands of libraries like this that do all sorts of things. So I'm gonna import the math library to tell it I wanna use the math library. Let me do this, get rid of that. I wanna use the math library and I hit dot. It comes up with all the things in the math library. All right, so I'm gonna find sign. There you go, sign. And then we put, this is in radians, as I said, hit return. And now I get my answer, okay? If you don't like to type math all the time, I can use this sort of syntax, which we will also be using to shorten names. Uh, I can import math as M. So from now on, instead of having to type math all the time, I can type M, right? It's just a convenience, a little shortcut. Um, some library names are quite long and you don't want to keep typing them again and again and again. Uh, and so you can shorten them, shorten them with that. Um, I mentioned help before. Um, there is help directly in the environment. So if I want to get help on some function uh, in a library, I can just type the function and then uh, put a question mark at the end and nothing happens. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, maybe, ah, right. Um, this is one of the issues with notebooks. You have to be really careful, which is one reason I don't particularly like them. Um, it looks like that this line, this line came before this, right? So it looked like that this line must have been executed and ready to go. But it wasn't because I never pressed the black, black arrow. So if I press this, now run it. Now go down here and do that. Uh, am I getting anything? Oh, hmm, what happened here, do you think? Anybody got any ideas? Uh, I think the help, up, the help popped up. Oh, sorry, it's on the, it's on the, I was on the right. Sorry, I wasn't looking. There it is. So normally in most of the environments, the help appears immediately underneath the cosine, underneath the thing, but here it appears on the, on the left. So here it is, it gives you an idea, returns the cosine of X measured in radians. All right. So with notebooks, this kind of system where you have cells, be very careful that whenever you execute a cell, that any cells before that that you needed to execute have been executed. 
it's really easy to make uh, mistakes like this in the notebook, uh, so you have to be careful. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll be importing libraries a lot. Okay, so the idea of importing a library either this way or this way will be something we'll be doing a lot. Okay. All right. Now there are a whole bunch of optional things I'm not going to go through. Um, just one of them, which is you might you may do something on loops. Um, so if you've ever done loops in programming languages, it's a way to repeat something you know a number of times. Python has this interesting uh, way of doing loops. Um, basically, has a, what's called the for loop, um, and there's two si two aspects to this. There's the variable that will be assigned the value of the loop, the loop variable, and then there's the values that will be picked out from as it loops. So you notice this is a list. Okay, so what this loop will do, it'll pick out one, two, three, and four, one at a time. So this loop will run four times. And each time it runs, it'll pick out one of these numbers and assign it to I. So if I run this, I get print I, print I squared, print I cubed. You can see I get uh, all, all this output. The other thing to mention here is this strange indenting. Um, if I don't say if, what happens if I don't indent this, uh, I get an error. Okay. This is another unusual thing about Python. It uses this kind of indenting to indicate what's part of a block of code. So in this case, actually, let me do, let me just do indent one. Okay. And then I'll run this. Now, if I run this one, uh, you'll notice that the answer, the output is one, two, three, four, and then 16 and 64. So what's happening is it's only out, it's, the loop is only executing what's, what's indented. And the only thing that's indented is the single print. After that, these are all unindented and therefore not part of the list. And what these prints are picking up is the last I, which is the four. So you have four, four, 16, Sorry, um, yeah, four, four, 16, and then four cubed is 64, okay? If I indent the whole lot, then all three are executed inside the loop, all right? If you make the mistake like this and don't have an even indent, you won't like it, all right? Indent error, okay? That's one of the other gotchas in uh, Python is the indenting, okay? Now I've got... Um, this, oh yeah, there's some more loops. Uh, I can do anything I like inside a loop, various calculations and so on. Um, and in fact, that's all I'm going to say about, if you want to learn, learn more about loops, the, the text is here, you can run these little scripts and you'll see what see what they do. I guess I should mention this, this one here. Um, you noticed I was using a list here. Let's say you wanted to loop something, uh, you know, a thousand times. Well, I'm not gonna type out a list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to a thousand. That would be ridiculous. So instead, Python has this shortcut thing. It has a method called range, which actually generates a list. So this will generate a list of 10 elements starting at zero. So if I run this, you'll see here's the list zero to nine. So I could put a thousand here, which I'm not going to. Well, let's put a hundred anyway. And I get a, a list of a hundred. There you go. All right. So it's a very convenient way for generating lists. And if you are going to create lists, it's all, people generally use this range method, okay? So here's the range. I'll run this, I get 45. So it's just summing up numbers zero to nine. Starting with zero gives me 45. Okay, so you'll see this sort of syntax a lot in Python, okay? All right, so I'm not going to go any more on, on that. The if statements are optional. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about lists, which you don't really need to know today, but you can add items to lists, delete items from lists and so on, access individual elements in the list. Uh, maybe I can do this actually, let me do this here. So I have the list here. I can ask for, uh, let's say I want to ask for the, um, list five. Now, if I do that, it prints out 11. Oh, not, no, I didn't want to do that one. Sorry, 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 sorry. Let's do this one. Print. Um, no, actually, let's generate. Let's go to, sorry, I'm jumping around here. Let's do this one instead. Let's go to 10. Then I'll print L 
five. Now, you might think that means it prints the fifth element. It doesn't. It prints the sixth element because the list starts at zero. Okay. So the five here is the sixth element. Okay. Because it starts from zero. So this allows you to index or extract individual elements from the list. Okay. And there's a whole syntax actually for extracting chunks of lists and uh, lots of things you can you can do with lists. All right, but we don't need to know too much of that for today anyway. We have if statements. I'll just show you this one. Conditionals, right? If something is true, then do something. Otherwise, don't do it. Um, the, these are optional. Uh, more about lists. User-defined functions. You don't really need to know today. This lets you define your own function that you might want to use, you know, like your own cosine function or whatever. Um, the one thing we will need to do a little bit on maybe is plotting, although Tellurium provides a lot of help on plotting and you may not need to do that. But if you want to do plotting, um, you have to import the plotting library. Okay, So this is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so this, this one you definitely want to make shorter and generally people shorten it to plot. Okay. So here's a really simple example. So if you've imported this library, it's called the matplotlib library. Um, you can just use the plot function and pass to it two lists. And there you can see it'll plot it. Okay. That is almost as much as you need to do, no, to plot, right? You just pass it a list of X values and a list of Y values, right? It'll plot it. Now, of course you can do all sorts of fancy things um, like, well, here I'm plotting random data, um, but you can change the color to green. Here now X and Y are two lists I've created. I can plot it in green. I can add markers, like an X marker. Um, I can change the marker to blue. Um, I can change the line to red. And change the marker from a, from a cross to a circle. Uh, what does this one do? Oh, I changed the whole thing to blue, not just the boundary of the marker. Um, here I'm adding labels, uh, an X label and a Y label and a, and a big title. That's what I get here. So, you know, producing basic plots with matplotlib is really, really easy, right? It's quite easy. You just have to remember all these um, commands, um, but we provide them all here. Um, I th think that's I that's really all I need. To, not too much to say on the plotting. I've listed all the colors you can have, but you can have lots of other colors. Um, one thing um, I should add, I mean, strictly speaking, after you've um, run the plot command, you're supposed to run the show command. Now, often you don't have to, but sometimes you can get in a bit of a pickle if you don't. Um, I should add that I can add um, extra plots onto this. Let's do... Let's do that, and then let's add some you know, random random data here. You got okay, your so if I run the first one, oops, oh yeah, thanks. Yeah. If I run this one, um, oops, ah, <laughs> here's another. Um, I have to remember to run the imports. So I have to go all the way up here and make sure I run the import. All right, so even I make these mistakes. So always remember to run the cells that you need. And I go back down here. So now I'm here and I run this. I get two plots. Okay. So the idea is that show sort of marks the end of a plot session. All right. So if I were to, after this, if I were to do another plot underneath, I'd end up with actually two plots that one and that one. Okay. So it's always a good idea to add the show. That basically marks the end of your plotting session. All right. Um, Often though we don't put show in because we're only doing one plot and it doesn't matter, but uh, sometimes it matters. So it probably best practice is to uh, add a show every time you finish a plot. Um, and I think that's it. Now there's great tutorials here on, uh, is a great uh, towards data science tutorial, matplotlib tutorial where you learn the basics, but you know, looking at it, you know, there isn't much you have to do, right? Uh, to do even some basic plots. Uh, just provide two lists, X and Y. Um, you can add colors and stuff if you want, line thicknesses and so on. Um, but the basic plotting is pretty simple. And of course, you can add as many plots as you want. All right. 
Uh, I guess I could add one thing. One of the things we'll be doing this afternoon is actually doing some bar plots. So if I just use bar, right, bar instead of plot, I get a bar plot. Okay, so that's nice and that's nice and straightforward. And there's lots of things you can do to um, change the colors of the bars and thicknesses and so on. Okay, um, I think that's all I'm going to say at this point. Um, there is a I, I'll add. There's one really important library called NumPy, which is basically for anybody doing data science or machine learning or modeling. NumPy is pretty much an essential library. It's basically a, a an array library. It's for handling arrays of data. Okay, uh, basically matrices and vectors. Um, they look like lists. Right, they're actually not lists, but they do look like lists, and they behave like lists. Um, but they're they're stored in a special way in Python, so that they're very, it's very, um, they're very efficient and very fast when you want to when you want to manipulate them. All right, so plot will accept these NumPy arrays as well. So in fact, all the data that comes back from the simulation engine that we use are NumPy arrays. Okay, but they you can treat them as if they're lists. They, they, they sort of almost behave almost completely like lists. Um, there are differences, but uh, um, I think you'll find them straightforward to use. Okay, that was a very, very fast introduction to Python. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, what, what? <laughs> I didn't understand any of it. Um, but hopefully with the, the examples of the exercises we're going to be doing today are pretty straightforward and you really don't need much more than what we've shown here. Okay. So um, the couple of things you need to know, I guess, uh, I guess I could add some of the essentials. Importing, uh, importing, um, signing variables, uh, the two S's. Uh, what else do we need to know? Um, Maybe the odd, I don't even know if you'll be using a for loop actually, but uh, maybe a for loop um, and calling functions, you know, like, you know, math.sign, that kind of thing. That's pretty much it, really. I don't think there's much else you need to know. As I said, you don't need to know much in Python to actually become, uh, actually to do useful things with it. All right. So that's um, Python. I want to now talk about the um, simulation software. Okay, the last 20 minutes, I want to talk about uh, the simulation software. And I have now here another slide, uh, or another uh, notebook, which is the Tellurium Antimony. Actually, I got two here. One is how to import the simulator. And the other one is uh, a general overview of the, of the various things you can do with the simulators. And I'm going to do a... Um, I'm going to show you some basic things you can do with our simulator. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on that and load up the loading the simulator notebook. So this is a really, really important notebook. All right. Um, there's a couple of things in things here that are completely new. Uh, the most important is this set of lines. Okay. And I'm going to copy these into chat. Okay. Um, because you will need those. This is only for. Colab, um, or at least the first two, anyway. Um, in order to get our package running, all right? Now, if you were to install our Spider installer, um, that co this comes with it for all this comes with it for free. If you use something like Thony, uh, you you might have to do this at least install uh, Tellurium. This thing here is a special for Colab. You don't have to do it anywhere else, just Colab. Uh, this is just a set of utilities I have that we'll use later on. You might as well install those. Um, but the critical one is this Tellurium. Of course, you must have, you must do this bit, this bit of magic. I'm not gonna explain what this does, this bit of magic, uh, but you must do this. So pip, pip install is the, is the way that people load in packages they need. Now the math package that I showed you, that's built in, right? So you don't have to install the math package. Um, but the NumPy package, you'll often have to install that. And uh, the Tellurium package, uh, you will always have to install that. 
but you only need it to install it once, of course. Once you've installed it, that's it. You've got it, got it forever. Okay. Matplotlib, it depends. Sometimes they, it comes with, sometimes the Python distributions come with matplotlib, sometimes they, they don't. So you might have to install that as well. But you, usually I find you don't. If you run through all this, get all this funny stuff coming up here, that's basically telling you that it's installing it. Now there's one little issue, however, with Colab. And this is because um, Google hasn't updated some of the most basic stuff in Python. And so everybody has to do this that uses Colab. Anybody who wants to use, you know, the modern, modern packages on Python, they will have to do this in Colab, all right? So you'll do this stuff here. But let me let me run it to see what happens. Okay, so it's running. Here it goes. This may take a little while. There's quite a bit to uh, install. All right. Here it goes. Um, I think that's it. Was it? Yeah, I think it did it. Yeah, it did it. Now it didn't show you much here because I already installed the stuff. Okay. So it claims everything is there. I don't need it, all right? Now, what you'll have to do though after this, to make sure everything works, you need to go to runtime and ask it to restart. Then you say yes. What that does is it makes, so we use more modern packages in our software. This makes sure that all the modern packages are in place for you. If you don't do that, Colab will complain about you're using something that's too new. It wants to use something that's old, uh, and you know you you might not like that. Okay, so um, the other thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do? I'm going to start this from scratch. Actually, I'm going to start a new new notebook just to show you it all again, right? Because this is the important bit. So here we have. I'm going to cut and paste that. This is the thing I just pasted to chat. Run the uh, black button and off we go. And we have this is a new notebook now, so it might probably has to install everything. Here it goes. Yeah, it's building everything. It comes. It's pulling everything off the web. Okay, everything is on the web here. And it's giving you a quick summary. If you don't put the minus Q, there's a minus Q here, which means quiet. Yeah, this is it being quiet. Uh, if you don't ask it to be quiet, it produces lots and lots and lots of stuff. Uh, which can clutter up your screen. But anyway, you make it, tell it to keep quiet. And there it is. Okay, so here you see an error, you see? That's the bit where it's saying, ah, oh, you, you're you using stuff that's too new for me. Uh, I'm, I'm using some very old packages. Um, so if I were to try to, so what you'd normally do at this stage is you immediately try to, let me produce a new code. You'll try to import Tellurium. If you do this, you might get a nasty surprise. If you do this, at this point you get an, an error message. And that error message is because of this bit here. To get around this, as I said, you have to go to the runtime menu, find the restart runtime, click that, say yes. Now, if I go back to this cell, and ask it to run this again, it's happy, okay? And you're ready to go, all right? So that's an important thing that you uh, need to do. Now you'll be doing a lot, you'll do, be doing a bunch of exercises in the next session. I'm just gonna show you a really simple um, model. So we're gonna build a really simple model, okay? So what I'm gonna do first, so the first thing to build a simple model is you need to import Tellurium, all right? So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to specify the model and you specify the model by doing, by writing this. Now in some of our installers, you get a template ready to go, all right? Where well, all this is provided, but here you need to type this yourself. So I'll put this into the chat so you can just copy and paste, okay? So this is where you're gonna put the model. So basically load A means it actually means load antimony. And antimony is the language that we use to specify models. So I'm going to specify a really simple model here. So this is what I meant by you don't have to write the differential equations. You can write down your model 
in a way that makes sense to you if you're a chemist or biochemist or molecular biologist or whatever. So this line here says there is a chemical species S1 and it gets converted to S2. Uh, let's do one more. Let's convert then S2 to S3. Now I can use any name I like here. So let's just put in glucose just for the, just for the hell of it. Um, I need to specify how fast these reactions are. And Michael will have more to say about this, but this is just saying how fast the reactions will be. K1 and K2 are rate constants. I need to you know, give them some values. Let's give them some values for me. I'm just gonna put random numbers in and I'll set up S1 to 10. I haven't specified units here, but these could be whatever units you want. Maybe the 10 is 10 millimolar and the rate constant is per second, but uh, uh, that's up to you. Okay, and I hit, if I execute this, I, uh, let's execute this, there we go. Oh, it's, I thought it would produce a new cell for me. Never mind. Okay, so it's actually loaded. If I go print R, it says Roadrunner. So this is a Roadrunner object. There's a lot of stuff here that you can ignore, but basically it's saying the model is loaded, ready to go. So what can I do here? Well, I can go, um, actually you can do shortcuts here. If I go get, let's say, can I do, yeah, get. So what I just did then was I tapped R dot get. Now, sometimes it'll just come up on its own like this. If it doesn't, you can hit the control shift button and it'll come up. But here are all the different things I can ask. So let's do the floating species IDs. Let's ask it for that, let's see what happens. Ah, there it goes. It's to telling me that the species, there are three species in the model, S1, S2, and glucose, okay? There's ones for parameters and so on. If I wanted to know what is the concentration of, of S1, I can just go R dot S1 and it'll tell me it's 10. What's the concentration of glucose? Nice thing, it comes up with glucose for me. I can just pick it, tell me it's zero. Okay, great. So now that I have my model loaded, I wanna do a simulation. So let's do a simulation. Um, I'm gonna do it this way, okay? So um, there is a simpler way to do it, but uh, I'm gonna show you this way because this is the way you normally mostly do it. And I'll just run this. That was it, it ran. The simulation has run. It was that fast, okay? Uh, what I'm asking it here, note that I'm using R everywhere, R dot. Basically, this is the R that, that represents your model. You can call this whatever you want. You can call it model if you want, like model equals T load A. It doesn't matter what you call it. I just call it R out of habit, okay? Um, so R, if you want to do anything with your model, you always refer to it in this case as R, and then R dot meaning do something with R, okay? All right, so what, what, I've, what I've asked it to do here is to run a simulation. And I've asked it to start time at zero, end the time at 10, and generate 100 data points for me. Now I can actually just leave that out completely if you want. And it'll give you some defaults, but I'm gonna be specific. Uh, actually, I wanna go 40. 100 data points. Let's rerun that again, shall we? There you go, run. Now, M contains all the, the results. So if I go, if I just go M, uh, you'll see all the results. There they are. All right. If you go to the top of the results, you'll see it's labeled the columns. First column is time, second is S1, second, third is S2, and the fourth is glucose. Now, normally you don't want to look at just numbers like this. That's not very, not very useful. Normally you'll just ask it, just plot, plot, plot the data, plot the last simulation you did. So this is why matplotlib is not always necessary for you. We have a built-in plot ready to go and it just plots the last simulation you did. So let me do, uh, run the plot and bingo, I have the plot, okay? All right. Um, now you notice it uh, actually didn't start at zero. You thought it would have started at zero and especially S1 should have started at 10. That's because I ran simulation twice, if you'd noticed. And the second time it basically picked up from where it left off before. So let me rerun the model. So it's now fresh. Now, if I do a simulation, now if I plot, now I get probably what you're expecting. So S1 starts at 10. S2 and glucose are both starting at zero. 
and uh, there you see the dynamics. Just to show you, if I run it again and plot it again, it basically carries on where it left off. Okay. All right. That's basically what it's done. All right. Now, instead of having to, you know, keep reloading the model like that, there's a shortcut. Um, I can go, if I type this, if I go R dot, there's a reset, reset method. That actually resets the model back to time zero, the original time zero. Uh, now, if I run this and plot, get that. Let's run it again. I should get now exactly the same thing again. And I do. All right. Just to show you, I can run this, say, for 400 time. And plot that. Now it runs up to 400, you see? All right. So it's pretty straightforward um, how to run simulations. My, my, my philosophy is you should be able to run a model in, run and plot a model in three lines. All right. So here's one line. I guess it's sort of one line. One line to uh, define your model. Uh, one line to run the simulation and one run line to plot, right? So within three lines, you can get a result immediately, okay? Maybe we got a couple of minutes. Let me just show you uh, one or two other things you can do with this. Um, let's say um, I'm going to break that back. Whoops, I'm going to take that back to 40. Okay, so I get that. And then actually, let me put the plot here because I, I don't want to have to keep typing cells all the time. Um, and I'm going to delete that cell. Okay, there you go. So now let's run. This is a this is a whole little yeah. So I get the plot. Let's say though, yeah, but you know, I really want to see S two because all the action, all the interesting stuff is happening S two. I just want to see S two. I don't want to see S one. I don't want to see the glucose. What do I do? There's an extra option on simulate. In fact, there's lots of options in simulate, but one really a useful one is a list, which is why I talked about lists a lot. In this list you can say what you want to end up in M, what columns. So the two, I want two columns. I want time, so time, you, time is a special uh, name you get for free. And the other thing I want is uh, S2. There you go, all right. Now, if I run this, I just get S2. Now it's plotted in blue, not orange, because the first color it uses is blue, all right. Um, but I could change that to orange if I wanted to. And there, there we have S2. Let's say I also wanted glucose. I could just keep, you know, add glucose. All right, and then I run this. Now I'll get glucose as well. Okay. So, you know, with just these, just these bits, you can do a lot of modeling. All right. You can um, define your model. Right. As complicated as you want it to be. By the way, I can do things like, you know, plus S3. And uh, let me set up, let's, let's do this just for the hell of it, shall we? So S3, let's set, set S3 to three, run that. So I changed the model, so I had to run the cell, okay? Rerun the cell. Um, actually, this should be times S3, should we do that? So this is a bit more complicated than the model. And uh, I'll go back to here, run it. Now it's different, okay? But if I were to get rid of all these, if I get rid of all those, it'll now plot everything. Uh, no, it doesn't. I have to rerun. I have to let me rerun the model and then run that. There you go. Yeah, the one issue with the um, with that list is once you set the list, it sort of remembers it afterwards. And if you wanted to forget about that, you either change the list or you just rerun the model and, and delete the list. Anyway, this is the that's the new simulation. It now includes S three as well. Okay, so you get slightly different dynamics. Okay, so I think that's a um, very fast intro to running a model. And you'd be doing hopefully a lot of these today, um, pretty much using the same sort of syntax. Um, I guess one thing I could add here is the help, of course, works. If I go R, simulate, and then question mark, I'll get all the help up, right, in all its uh, gory detail, okay? Um, and I can do this plot has also one as well. Uh, and plot has lots, lots, of, lots of options to it. Okay, so plot lets you directly set the uh, x and y titles, the main title, the line widths, uh, and so on. You can do log plots, and linear plots, and so on. 
You can also save, for those of you who are interested, you can save your figure directly to a PDF. So I could save this. I won't do it on the web, but if I was on the desktop, I could save this plot actually as a PDF, which I could then include in you know, a published article or something. Or you can save it as a PNG if you want, bitmap. All right, I think I'm done there. Any big questions? Not much on chat. Um, I think that might be probably straightforward, but as you start to use this, you'll probably come up with questions. Um, but is there anything now we can answer it now? Uh, otherwise I can hand off to Michael. All right, are we good? Um, from the instructors, anything I missed out that you think I should mention? No? Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, where's there a how to get help in this stuff? I forget these things. Where do I find look for help? Um, if you're on the web and you want to find help, uh, what you can do is you can go if you go to Tellurium, uh, SBML, for example, or Tellurium modeling or something in Google, um, you'll it'll come across the first hit will be well, this hit happens to be the, the main documentation, um, but there's also something which I actually should have showed you. Everything is on the GitHub site as well. If I go to the GitHub site, let's have a quick look at those actually. In fact, this is something I wanted to show you. So this is the GitHub site. So GitHub is a place where people store all their code. And this is where Tellurium and Roadrunner and everything is stored. Um, if you scroll, this stuff is not of interest to you, but if you scroll down, you start getting the introduction and a little example. And what's important to most of you probably are the installation instructions. So there are various ways to install it. Um, let me go down here. So if you're a spider, if you like, want to use that colorful um, IDE, that environment, um, on when, on this is the section you want to look at. We have, I think these are about to get updated. So I wouldn't, um, you can install these now, but there's going to be a big update um, either today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, it's already been updated actually, so. Oh, there you go. It's I don't know updated. if that particular link still works, but the there should be a new. Yeah, two four. There's, that's two four is a new one, isn't it? Yeah, it's two four. Yeah. Oh, this is the the newest ones. Um, I wouldn't worry about Python three seven three eight. Uh, the ones that we're going to really support are three ten and three eleven. These are the the more yeah. new, newer, shinier versions of Python. Uh, this one, if you click that link, it'll download a, a, an installer. You just run that, you get everything. Everything you need, you don't have to do anything else. Okay, the Mac is a little bit more complicated, and um, and uh, Linux is a little bit more complicated as well. The those of you who who like notebooks, we also provide a notebook, a Jupyter notebook interface with the Spider download. So this download here includes Spider, but also includes the Jupyter notebook as well. If you want to use that on the desktop, okay, so that's convenient. Um. But if you use something like your own, like PyCharm or um, Sony or, or Visual Studio Code, the way to get um, that software is to use the pip installer, pip install Tellurium, okay? All right. But if you're not sure about that and you're at least you're running on Windows, I would use one of our pre-built installers. Uh, it makes life a lot simpler, okay? Um, so that's one place to get at least uh, installation help. If you want now help on, actually, that's our main site. Let me go back up here. If you go back up here, back to the top introduction, you see documentation down here. What you want is the general. Go to general, and then you get the the big, the big set of documentation. Okay, and so we have a quick start. Okay, it takes you through some examples. A simple example, a more complicated example. Um, we have a walkthrough. There are lots and lots of examples here. Okay. All right. Goes on and on and on. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, usage examples. We have even more examples. Um, the other thing, the uh, the the modeling format we use is this antimony. 
So there's a extensive documentation on the antimony. So this is the way of defining a model. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of, I mean, basic antimony is really easy, but there's lots of bells and whistles to it. You can add more stuff to it. Um, what else we got? Um, there's an extensive list of, of all the methods that are available. And it's a pretty big tool kit we have. Um, I, and you'll see some of this, some of this today. Okay. Um, the other thing I should add, those of you who do stochastic simulation, you can do a stochastic simulation as well. Anyway, there's a mass of stuff on there and you'll see some of this today as we go on. Okay. All right. Does that answer your question, uh, Andrew, Steve? Yeah, thanks. That was helpful. Okay. All right. Great. All right, Mike, should I hand it over to you? Sure. Right. All right. <clears throat> So I'm just going to give you a, a quick introduction to enzyme kinetics. Um, so there's these slides and two uh, collab notebooks are in the uh, folder for this course. The two notebooks are the examples from a few examples from these slides and then the answers to the questions at the end. All right, so I'm going to start off with a couple slides on mass action kinetics. So chemical reactions the, with no intermediaries, um, these are called elementary reactions. So the simplest reactions you can think of, A is converted to B, nothing in between. Uh, these reactions have often have reaction rates um, proportional to the product of the molar concentration of the reactants raises some power. For mass action kinetics, that power is typically is usually it is the um, stoichiometric coefficients. Um, you know, you look at it another way, it's just it's just the molar con the product of the molar concentrations. Um, general form of these reactions are listed here. There's you know, two ways you can do it: irreversible and reversible exactly how they sound irreversible it goes, only goes one direction um reactants are converted to products but not the other direction so in these reactions the uppercase letters would be the concentrations and the lowercase letters would be the uh, coefficients the stoichiometric coefficients and the rate law um, according to right this setup the product of molar concentrations for example irreversible would be in this one, um, K, which is just a rate constant, times uppercase A to the power of lowercase A, that's its coefficient, uppercase B concentration to the power of the lowercase B, its coefficient and so on um, for all reactants. For reversible, it's the same thing, but you have to subtract off the products as well because the reaction goes in the reverse direction, right? So, yeah, so the products in that case, if it's going the other direction, actually become reactants, you have to um, account for that. In this box over here, we have a, an example, uh, adenylate kinase 2. It transfers one phosphate from ADP to another molecule of ADP. So we have two ADP here. Um, converts that to ATP and uh, AMP. And under mass action kinetics, the reaction rate is this here. Oh, if anybody have any questions, just just go ahead and just you know give them to me. That's fine. Um, order of the reaction. All right. So depending on what that coefficient is, it can have a drastic effect on the reaction rates. Well, so for example. Um, a is converted to B uh, here. So what what are what's assume it's an irreversible reaction, the coefficient A, whatever that is, has a huge effect on, on the reactant rate. If for example it's zero, kind of contrived example, but it could happen. Um, 
the reaction rate is just a constant. It's a, it's it's just a constant no matter what the concentration of A is. If it's a if A were one, lowercase a were one, that's a first order reaction. Um, in that case, it's linear. So the reaction rate increases linearly with a concentration. If it were two, it'd be quadratic, right? So the reaction rate is going to be parabolic um, in, in terms of with regard to concentration. So the order of reaction is, you know, makes a huge difference in the characteristics of these, these reactions, the rates. Here's a quick example. Uh, first order reversible mass action. About as simple as you can get. This is the code. Let's see. All right, so this is one of the notebooks. I've already run through all the preliminaries, so it's all set up, ready to go. Here is the this example. Uh, real simple, it goes to steady state. Um, and when it goes to steady state, what you wind up with is some sort of equilibrium. So down here, we have the equilibrium, equilibrium constant K, which is just the concentration of B over A once it's found e, you know, that equilibrium point. So Michael, when you show the notebook, can you um, zoom in a bit? Because the text is very small. Yep. There you go. That's great. Thanks. All right. All right. So that brings me to chemical equilibrium. So let's see. Yeah. So general form of uh, equilibrium constant for a reaction of this type, uh, reversible a reversal reaction reaction of this type is given here. Right. So. There's no step here. You find the rates. Um, you set the rate to zero, right? So let's see. Right. So at, at equilibria, these rate laws, you know, basically you just set these to zero. And that will that's how you get the, the equilibrium constant. So yeah, so you go from this reaction. Uh, write out the rate law, set it to zero, then you can rearrange things to get these equilibrium constants. And again, lowercase are the stoichiometric coefficients and uppercase are the concentrations. Okay, so a couple of specific important equilibrium constants for this particular reaction, which is a binding reaction. So H and A are both uh, reactants or, or sub uh, reactants here. They bind to form a complex HA, the rate of which is given here. All right, so at equilibrium, you set that to zero. You can rearrange, do some algebra, and find two separate uh, equilibrium constants. This association constant for the binding one molecule to another is given by this. Um, note that it's not only the concentration of the complex over the uh, product of the two reactants, but also involves uh, another, another form of it is the, the rate constants themselves. So this is the forward and reverse rate constants. The dissociation constant, the Equilibrium constant for the unbinding of the molecules is just the inverse of the association constant. So everything is just flipped here. And we'll see KD again in a moment. Enzyme catalysis. Um, yeah, so association constant, no, the association or dissociation con or constants are easier to come by than, for example, catalytic constants. So in this case, in this reaction down here, K1, K negative one are forward and reverse uh, rates, rate constants. K2 is the catalytic constant. And that's more difficult to measure. 
All right, so what do we do when we can't measure constant? Well, you can make some approximations. <clears throat> a couple different ways to do it. Um, rapid equilibrium and steady state. I'm gonna go through both of those real briefly. Okay, first the rapid equilibrium uh, approximation. Here we're assuming the binding and non-binding substrate to enzyme is much faster than the release of products. So the left side of the equation is very fast. The right side is slow, relatively speaking. So once we, do, once we make that assumption, we can assume the binding of the substrate to the enzyme is, is an equilibrium. So what that means basically is even though this whole reaction in its entirety is still ongoing, we can assume equilibrium of this first part, which makes things, which simplifies things. So again, even though it's not going, we can still have this KDE value um, based on the concentrations of the enzyme, the substrate, and the enzyme substrate com complex. So this is a quick derivation of that approximation. Um, the rate, getting the rate for it. The box on the right, this is what we know so far. We have this, we have the reaction and we know the dissociation concept. All right. Another thing, thing we know is the uh, total enzyme. So the total enzyme is just the free enzyme, which is E, and the enzyme that's in complex. All right. So we substitute E, all right, KD has E in it. So we rearrange the, this equation, solve for E, and then substitute that in for into the equation for KD, so equation one. From there, we can solve for ES. So rearrange, do a bit of algebra. Now, at this point, we just multiply by K2. Um, Substitute in V for K2 times ES. So this is where we multiply it by K2. And also substitute in VM, which is a V max uh, for K2 and E total. So these are both constants. So that makes V max a constant. So what we're left with is this equation here in green. So now we've gone from three um, kinetic constants, K1, K negative one, forward and reverse binding constants, and K2, the catalytic constant. We've reduced that to V max and KD, both of which are easier to uh, measure experimentally. And I'll, I'll I'll talk a little more about uh, Vmax in a moment. First, I'm gonna go through the other approximation, the steady state approximation. So in this approximation, what we're doing is assuming there's enough substrate to saturate the enzyme, right? If the enzyme's saturated, then we can assume that its rate of change is zero. So let's see. When we work out the, well, the rate of change for the complex, which is this, and assume it's zero, that gives us more, gives us flexibility to uh, do some simplification. All right, so this is the derivation for the steady state approximation from Brig and Haldane. Again, in the box over here, this is what we know. We have our reaction, and we know we have our steady state approximation. Uh, rate of change of the complex is, we're assuming, is zero. Again, we have a total enzyme. Um, ET equals free enzyme plus the enzyme in complex. So let's see. Yeah, we substitute that E, well, we solve for E, substitute it into our 
equation for um, DES DT and rearrange or solve for ES, our complex. Again, we're multiplying both sides by K2, our catalytic constant, and making the same two substitutions along with another one, Km equals the reverse binding constant uh, plus the catalytic constant all divided by the forward um, uh, binding constant, which yield, and this is the uh, uh, Michaelis constant. So that yields this equation, um, the Michaelis Mann equation. And I would note that, again, we have VM. If, again, we, we've reduced it from three catalytic constant or th three uh, kinetic constants down to two, in this case, VM and KM. And I would note that as long as the reverse uh, binding constant is much greater than the catalytic constant, we have this relation, which means that KM is approximately the same as KD. All right, so what does this do for us actually? Um, let's see. Yeah, so we have Vmax uh, and KM, the mechanics constant. Vmax is the maximal reaction rate. So that's the rate when the enzyme is fully saturated. So it's the highest rate we can possibly get. Makes it easier to measure. Uh, KM is the substrate concentration at which the reaction rate reaches half of Vmax. So those are both much easier to come by than all of these kinetic constants. So that's why they do that approximation. All right, so here's a depiction of actually what's going on. Um, let's see, this is a simulation with these kinetic constants and these initial values, you know, for this reaction here. Note that uh, for a good portion of it, uh, a little more than about half, the rate of change for the complex is indeed zero. And look at the enzyme, it has been pretty much fully saturated all the way until, and, and this is true, until the substrate S is essentially entirely used up. Go to cool out. I'll show you that. Yeah. This is the plot of that. This is also the basis of the first uh, exercise. So this is exercise A1 to that will ask you to reproduce this, but so that's the reaction. Now, <clears throat> usually you wouldn't want to measure for you know, V max KM, right? Well, we have the constants, so we can actually do that. We can actually compute them if we want. So if you do that, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back out. If you do that and, you know, redo the model with, with that approximation, you get this plot here. Now it's shifted a little bit. Part of that's because this, Initial drop here, that's pretty artificial because we don't really know where things are starting. Um, but it does pick up very well on the linearity of the consumption of S and the production of P. So that's what we get when we approximate something from this, from the top one to something similar to the bottom one. So you're saying that the, um, the, orange, the orange line and the blue lines are similar in both plots? Yes, right. at least in the, except, lin the linearity. Except for the linearity bit, yeah, except for the initial. What causes that initial drop? I, I think it's just because we don't really know what um, isn't it the, where we're um, starting. Isn't it the transient where the enzyme yeah. uh, picks up the substrate, forms a complex? Yep. 
I think that's what it is. Yeah. And after so that, that, from it, that it models, that's why it's... after that, it models the uh, the same. Yeah. Yeah. So if you change this to eight, about where it started, so it goes down to about eight, starts there. Um, it's very similar, except you don't have as much product in the end, but it tracks a little closer for the over the uh, linearity linear part. So it's not perfect, but it is an approximation and much easier to deal with and probably much better in if you're actually measuring things, you know, in vivo than it is, because this is, you know, kind of a bit of a contrived example, which is why I think I think this bit, this transient part's probably just artificial because we don't really know where things are starting in the real system, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But so Again, this is the full kinetics on top, and this is the approximation on the bottom. All right. All right, so irreversible reactions are good for what? In vivo, right? Um, um, no, in, in vitro um, experiments. But in vivo, you're always going to have product, and depending on, on the uh, reaction you're dealing with, you could easily go the opposite direction as well. So irreversible isn't necessarily realistic in a lot of cases. So there are also state state approximations for the reversible case. So in a reversible case, you simply add this guy here, this reversible, uh, you know, this Rate constant, this you know, this reaction from the product and the enzyme back to the complex. And it gives you one more constant. It's K negative two. So go through the derivation and you get this as your rate. Now it's it's not too bad, but it is more complicated. So I'm not going to go through it here. If you really want to see the derivation, there is a pretty good one here at this um, uh, website. I've listed on here on the bottom. So the reactions, the constants here, you have VF and VR. These are forward and reverse Vmax constants. You have KS and KP, and these are substrate and product KM values. And just to compare, this is the, down here is the irreversible counterpart. And I put it in the same form, and it looks very similar. So it isn't either just a reversible um, version of the stem thing. All right, so what does that do for us? Well, if we let it run to equilibrium, then our rate becomes zero. Um, that puts S and P into their equilibrium values. Um, and of course, if the rate is zero, the denominator doesn't matter. We can throw that away. And we get this guy here. Rearranging that gives us a, another equilibrium constant um, that we see in green. Now, this shows that these constants are not um, independent, right? So if you increase VF, for example, you would have to increase VR or, or KS or what have you. <laughs> Another thing, you know, it does a couple other things. So let's see, these are Haldane relationships, right? Uh, they put constraints on the values of the kinetic constants. I mentioned that. Um, and another thing we can do here, which is why we do these approximations, is we can eliminate you know, some uh, kinetic constants that are more difficult to measure with those that are easier to measure. So in this case, we can and what replace the reverse Vmax value with more easily determined equilibrium constant. So we computed K, the KEQ here, and we've gone ahead and just replaced it. We solved <coughs> for the reverse Vmax and then just replaced it 
and you wind up with this equation here. Let's see. It also allows us to kind of pull these apart into separate components, which for more complicated, um, you know, kinetic equation work is something that you often do. So in this case, we have the thermodynamic term, which looks like the, it's kind of the uh, mass action part of it, and the saturation term. Is there anything I'm missing there, Herbert? On the um, Haldane relationships? You're muted. Uh, You're no, muted. it's just a relationship between the four constants. And we can exploit it to eliminate one of the constants from the um, Michaelis Menten equation. Yeah. All right. Because the about start the equilibrium constants you can often look up in databases. Okay. Whereas the, the reverse Vmax, you can't. Oh. All right, so this stuff can get much more complicated, um, like multi subunit kinetics. So there may be more, yeah, maybe, maybe more than one substrate reactants involved. So, like in an ordered reaction, an enzyme may bind to A and then bind to another one, bind to B as a substrate, and then um, release product P and then Q. In random order, may not matter which one's bound first. Ping pong reactions are interesting. So A may bind, um, leave some sort of residual on the enzyme and then releases P. Then B binds, picks up that residual, uh, maybe it's phosphate, I don't know. Um, and then it releases Q. So there are lots of different forms these kinds of reactions can take. And there are lots of different uh, um, methods to get at these more generalized uh, rate, rate laws that can account for different amounts of substrates or um, um, other molecules that, that change the, the reaction. Here's a good example down here of the Liebermeister stuff. If you want to look that up. Sigmoid responses. Um, often seen in multimeric systems. So phosphofructokinase, for example, it's a tetramer. So four parts, four subunits. Um, and the point here is, is you, don't, you don't have this purely hyperbolic response, you have the sigmoid response instead. These tend to work through cooperation. Um, so one site's bound, it changes the binding affinities, the remaining sites. So maybe it increases the affinities uh, for the others. So they're more likely to bind. Thus, they work in cooperation. So how do we model these? Um, Hill equation is the simplest model we can use for that. It's so simple, it may be unrealistic. So we assume everything binds simultaneously. So you got your enzyme, you have your N substrates. Um, again, assume they all bind simultaneously and you get ES as your complex. You assume rapid equilibrium, um, do your replace your substitution for the enzyme and you wind up um, with your with your Hill equation, which is also ca often cast in the form as you see down here on the bottom right. Looks a lot like the michaelis menten equation, except now there are Hill coefficients n on each of the substrates. In practice, that looks like this. So Hill coefficients describe the degree of cooperativity. Again, if it's one, you're you're reduced to the chaos mountain equation and it's simply hyperbolic. And greater one, greater than one, you have positive cooperativity. And equals one, no cooperativity. And less than one is negative. Let's see. I have an example here. Could you zoom in? Yep. Could you could you go over the maybe the basically what the code does? Um, sure. All right. So 
Import Telerium, import NumPy, NumPy. Um, import matplotlib. So the model, model um, is one reaction. S is converted to P here. You have your Vmax value um, times your substrate to uh, the power of your, your Hill coefficients, all divided by Km to the Hill coefficient, which yeah, it's often put in there too. And of course, this is really, you can just replace this with a single constant if you want. Um, plus the substrate, again, to the Hill coefficient. Uh, Vm, here is 10, Km is set to 5.1 over 100. So basically I got that from this, essentially. I just pull the numbers from that. Um, initially, I set H to one and the substrate to, let's see. Yeah, substrate initial value is zero. Um, let's see, load the model. Uh, I went through eight different. All right, so I did a loop over, you know, eight values. This is an eight or actually seven values, substrate. Seven values of H. Um, let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> so the numbers, so let's see. Uh, NP.lin space basically is just a, a vector of, of values. The results, let's see. So numbers is your x-axis. Yes. Two. Yeah, so I mislabeled this. The x-axis should be S. Yeah, so it's the concentration. I'm just increasing yeah, no, the concentration. Yeah. Numbers is your x-axis. The result yep. is going to be uh, initially empty, but you're building up the data. Correct. All right. So let's see. And then you yeah, go through. The uh, you go through each number in the x-axis. That's the concentration. Yep. That's what this yeah. is. Um, and each row. Let's see. So J one is a is a new concept. You might want to explain in the uh, antimony, because I didn't cover that. What is J1? Wait, what? J1, the syntax. Oh, um, yeah. So that is just a, a, a moniker for the reaction. So we we'll label that as J1. And it will give you the reaction rate, right? Um, yes. Yeah. All right. So we run through that. Basically, it runs over these concentrations for each of the hill. hill the hill constant values and produces seven different plots for them. Let's see. So yeah, S, these are the concentration, S is the concentration. Each plot is a different hill value, hill equation or hill, hill constant. constant. Um, and then J1 is the, the rate, right? So yeah. as you increase the concentration of the uh, substrate or the reactant, the rate should go up, and it does. But it does in a different fashion at each different uh, hill coefficient. So when it's one, you see it's just hyperbolic, equivalent to the Kalos Metten. As you start to increase, it becomes more and more sigmoid. And I would think, you know, I don't know, if you just went all the way, like ran it to its limit. The infinity would probably just be a step function, right? Yeah. I never tried that, but yeah, it's a step um, function. Yeah. So that's what that looks like. It's just a parameter scan over different uh, hill values or hill coefficients. All right. The lots of problems with hill equation. It's too simple, it's unrealistic. It's not as flexible, um, more difficult to add inhibitors or activators. 
you could you could do that just by tacking on something at the, at the beginning if you want but it's not inherently easy to do and what our researchers think is just an empirical result and not really fundamental and with that we have about 20 minutes left for exercises so well, should I just give them time to uh, go ahead and go through them or? Um, might be because we only got 20 minutes. Do you have, maybe we can cut and paste the actual model to the chat and then they can just add the simulation statements. Do you have that? Do you have just the yeah, model? Probably, yeah, I can probably do that. Huh? Put that into the chat. There's the model. Okay, good. So the type there's uh, he just posted the model to the chat. Okay, so do you want to go back to the exercise? What do they have to do? Um, I'm sorry. What? Can the... you go back to the exercise? What do they have to do with this? Oh, the plot now. Yeah, so assume the following values. This is um, K1 equals 100, K minus 1 equals 1, K2 equals 5, um, enzyme equals 2, enzyme total equals 2, or the initial value is 2. So what do and I have S to do? equals 10. So run the simulation, build the model. So recapitulate the model from slide 12, basically. Should be the same thing. Run simulation from 0 to 1.5. And yeah, just recapitulate that model. Okay, That's, so how long do you want to how long do you want to give them for that? Um, oh, this is what they have, oh, this is what they have to do then. Okay, then they have to do this. Okay. Right. Then set it to two, set k1 to two, k negative one to 0 0.1. See what happens. How long does it take to get to steady state? Longer or shorter? Um, maybe play with some other values if you want. Um, see if you can do the opposite. Then set it to K1, K1 to 2000, K negative one to 100, see what if that changes anything and try to figure out why. And for the first start, 1C, name the reaction and check for the rate of reaction, check the rate, right? Just plot the rate of it. Those are, yeah, so those are the three parts to exercise one. Okay, so let's do that then. All right. So give me like five minutes and then I'll go through them. Yeah, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's uh, wait. Let's give them five minutes. See what you can, uh, see if you can uh, rerun this simulation. So he's given you the, the basic model in the uh, chat. So you need to um, import Tellurium, load that model, Run a simulation and plot it. That's basically what you have to do, okay? And then you can answer the uh, the two questions on the previous slide. Do you want to go back to the previous slide? I'm sorry. Yeah. No, not that one. Next one. Yeah, no, you need to run it for, yeah, that's what, that's right, yeah. Run the simulation, I'll just type it on type, run the simulation to 1.5 time units. Okay, so we'll come back in. Um, uh, five minutes, see how far you've got. Somebody wants you to resend the model, they got disconnected. I go. Done. There you go. Right. Now, there's a slight difference to what uh, Michael has done. Um, I, I, when I, when I, it's just for how to habit. That's all. When I specify a model, 
I specified directly in the in the load A, okay, uh, in using triple in using triple quotes, okay. So I put the model here, like that. So I put it in the well, I put a, put a real model in. The triple quotes. Uh, no, it's going into chat. Oh. The uh, the triple quotes lets you um, do multiple lines, so they're just one line. So. So that's one way to do it. Actually, it's not M. It should be R. Sorry, I complete. That's completely messed up. That's a text. Let me type it again. Okay, this is better. There you go. It, sh it should be like that. So that's one way of doing it. The other way to do it is to, which is what Michael's been doing, is you specify a string, assign a string to a variable, then pass that variable to load A. Right, both work. It's just a matter of taste. Okay. Sorry, I think you'd need to share your screen. Or no, not. it's on chat. Do you have chat? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So it's on chat. So you can either use load A. Forget the first load A it was completely messed up, but the second one, R equals T load A. Everything was in in quotations in the method call itself. Um. And you need to use triple quotations if you want to have a multi-line string. Uh, but the other way is to assign that string to a, a variable first, like model, and then pass that variable name into load A. So. I saw a question about, um, so yeah, I find um, loading, you know, naming the, naming the string and loading it that way is, well, it's better if you're doing like, you know, lots of production work, like loading lots of models. That's probably the better way to do it. Oh I mean, yeah, just, you can just pick. You can just pick different strings. Yeah, then, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. So there's a question about the. Uh, well, I raised km to the power. To the. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, you. What you have to do, you have to. If you're going to raise the km to the power. Yeah. You have to raise the entire bracketed denominator to the power. Hmm. Oh. I All right. Believe. Well, I, that's this. That's the only way I get it to work. I, I wasn't getting any sigmoid. No, you values. should do. No, it shouldn't matter. No, no, no. Well, when I when I left it off, it, it didn't it didn't get it. I mean, that's, that's why well, I did. It was sloppy. That, I admit that. that weird. But... That was weird. Hmm. No, it shouldn't. That's it. Shouldn't matter. Hmm. Hmm. You had a power in the numerator as well. Oh, let's go back and look at that. Yeah. See, because the derivation, right? You don't get the, uh, to the right. power in, on the K. Uh, so K is a constant and independent of uh, the Hill coefficient. Sure. So if you go back to your model, let's have a quick look at your model. Uh, scroll down. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Mm. So this is the only way I could get it to work. If I just have KM there, it doesn't. It Pick, take it out. Results are not. Pick out the H from there. Yeah. So I get that. Oh, no, no, no. That's because you're not uh, running for long enough. Your H is, your, your S is not going up high enough. Yeah, no, it's too high. Anyway, yeah, if you drop it down a bit. There you go. Yeah, that works. It works, yeah. I'll fix that before. Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh, it should be fixed. Mm. Uh, yeah okay 
There is some chat. Yeah, I think somebody noticed that in your equation. So how are people getting on? If you've got any problems, um, you can share your screen as well if you want. Just let us know. So in the um, your enzyme simulation with the full mechanism, we saw that drop. If you were to simulate, um, okay. yeah, that one. If you were instead to simulate from say zero to point oh one, I think you'd see some dynamics at the beginning. Let's try point one. Let's see what it looks like. There, see, it's not, it's the, it's the enzyme taking up the enzyme substrate complex. Right. Yep. So, uh, but in a real system, is not going to be like already at some sort of equilibrium. And this is. Oh yeah, and if you're running a steady state model, this will already have happened. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my the thing. Is this is just kind of artificial because it's. Well, no, it's no, it's not artificial. It's real. It, but. The problem comes is when you try to run the model in time. If you try to run a metabolic model in time and your enzyme substrate complex is a, is a significant amount of mass in the system, mm -hmm. it'll cause delays. As the transients go up and down, the enzyme complex will fill and empty, and that causes delays in the, in the system. And so the dynamics will actually look slightly different. Because the Michaelis Menten approximation, the rate the rate is instantaneous. Oh, there's a question on the chat. Uh, K one equals two and K minus one equals point one seems to take a long time to reach steady state. Do you have that example you can try? No, that's what I asked him to do, right? I don't know. Have a look. What, what is your slide? Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, that's. So, I have that. So I have you, probably go ahead and uh, look at that. Show that on the screen. Somebody says it's taking much longer to reach steady state. So that's the conclusion. As it right? should. Yep. That's what it looks yeah. like. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So it takes much longer. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Notice that the um the the sort of steady state portion is not doesn't last as long. So the green line he shows there, it, it's continuously changing actually pretty much. It, there doesn't seem to be a quasi steady state of much of a one. Um, so, that, so the approximation isn't great then under these conditions. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, go through them. How I, well, okay, let's then. see. Did anybody have any problems? <clears throat> No. Okay. All right. So that was one and or A and, A and B. Well, like this one. Setting K1 equals 2000, K negative one equals 100. We get back to what we had. Oh, yeah. So, so that doesn't make any better, difference. Much better approximate. Oh, yeah. You see, you're already fast already. Is that what you're saying? And so yep. you're going it any faster doesn't make any difference. Yeah. So yeah. this yeah. with. K1 equals 2000 is basically the same, is essentially the same as, as this with 100. Yeah. Because the ratio is the same. Yeah. And for the named reaction, um, this is. We might have to explain the, how, how you did that in the model because we didn't cover, cover this. So all right. Explain, yeah. So this one, it's yeah. split, right? So the binding reaction is here. Yeah. Um, it is not named. I didn't name that one. Yeah. And the um, catalytic reaction is here, and that is named J2. So note the syntax all the J2, J2 colon. Yeah. Yeah. 
that is, yeah, that's how you name a reaction. Um, the kinetic constants are the same. Those conditions are the same. So down here, when you simulate, you do selections, um, time. So time is what is, is going to be the y or the, the x-axis. If you omit that, you get, you get some weird results. Um, and J2, so you, so you can put anything here. You can put in uh, kinetic constant. Of course, it's going to be, in this case, a like constant. But you can put in uh, species, or you can put in the um, reaction, and it will give you the rate of change. So for the catalytic reaction, you get you know, this initial jump, and then this basically steady state where it's converting, you know, the complex to um, product is, and is steady here because the, the complex itself is, is steady. Um, and then once, you know, substrate gets used up, it starts to drop off. Yeah. Because that's what okay. you should get for that one. Yeah. Let's go to exercise two. Let's see. Oh yeah, debugging. <clears throat> um, I can go ahead and put this model in the yeah. chat as well. It's that model. Don't explain so, the dollars and stuff. Yeah. Good yeah, dollars. so dollar just mean, it means it's a constant, which means, you know, so you set S1 to 10, it will always be. 10, it will not be consumed at all in this reaction. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's a there's an error here. There's something going wrong. It's not an error that will you know give you a a, a programming error. It's it's something that makes the system not be realistic. So go ahead and run this and try and figure out what it is and fix it. Probably just, no, let's just do this one and then the last one's pretty not much of a problem but yeah so i'll give you about three or four minutes to do this one and, and then we'll look at it yeah So the first person who's, who observes the uh, the dynamics um, put it into the chat. So J the J two oh yeah somebody asks the J two plot is showing yeah uh, correct mm -hmm. the J two plot is basically showing K times E S. Yeah, so you can name any reaction you want and. If you refer to that name, you effectively get the rate of that reaction, whatever it is, and it's, which is the rate law, of course. So if you're building metabolic models, the flux through a metabolic model is usually an important thing you want to look at. Uh, and so that's why we let you do that. So you can name one of the enzymes in your metabolic model, and then just ask for the flux through that enzyme. Yeah, so somebody says they're on, on a mobile. In theory, you could run this on your mobile, but it might be a bit awkward. All right, let's go ahead and have a look at that. So this is what you get if you run it. It just goes to infinity. 
So what goes to infinity? S2. S2 goes to infinity. And where is S2 in the model? S2 is, let's see. Intermediate. Yeah. Let's see. So the question is, why does it go to infinity? Does anybody know? Yeah, if you're not used to models, this won't be at all obvious to you. No. I mean, you'd expect it to S2 to level off, right? As it reaches steady state or something, but it's not. When I mean, you can simulate, you know, to a million, it still goes up in a straight line. So the question is why? Mm -hmm. Well, there is a sink for us too. It's this, this second equation. Yeah, there's a sink. Yeah. Hey, one thing you could do, uh, Michael, is um, name name the first reaction uh, J one, and plot J one and J two together as well together. So if somebody says there's no sync for S2, there is a sync for S2, it's a J2. He's labeling it J2. So there is a sync for J2. So what's going on here? So just plot uh, J1, yeah, plot time, J1 and J2. That might give a clue. what i do so, yeah you don't have to put selections in you can yeah you can leave it there okay, there you go okay that's the uh that's the plot of j1 and j2 somebody explain what's going on with j1 to begin with why is j1 a straight line horizontal yeah. straight line it fixes it that's one yeah it's fixed exactly so the rate is fixed constant source exactly yep. and the constant source is at 1.0 whatever is moles per second and what's happening to the orange line yeah, since if that's two kids to into you, you you reach the the upper bound of the act absolutely the, 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 the rate yep. absolutely so you've reached the second enzyme has, has reached saturation and the saturation rate is given by vm which is 0.5 so the orange line reaches a max of 0.5 so you can see that you're injecting this fixed rate of 1.0 into the system but the sink is only able to absorb 0.5 and so you have a 0.5 difference and so that means S2 just keeps on going up forever and ever and ever. Yep. So one one fix would be to just set VM, uh, Vmax2, anything greater than one, and it should work. Yeah, and then that's great. Yeah, and then, so, say, then now it reaches steady state now. Yeah. There are, you know, there are lots of little bugs like this that you can, that can end up in a model, and sometimes they can be, you know, difficult to pinned down but you know with a more experience you get to see where what what's going on and by plotting different things you can start to figure out what's going on with the model so um i think that's it right there's one question let's just i'll just leave them with the last question they can can play with it okay um basically reconstruct the model from a1 but do it with a make it re reversible oh yeah and you know set K2 to one or try different values and just see what happens or yeah, what doesn't okay. happen. What doesn't happen is, is kind of what's important. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, all right. Do you want a little break? Anybody got stick up your thumbs if you want a break, five minute break or something. Everybody wants to, one person. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mobile platform wants a, wants a break. 
Yeah, we'll have a five minute break then, all right? So we're back. Let's come back at uh, 10 past the hour, okay? Okay. And then uh, should we Joe will, break uh, this up as far as the recordings go and stop this one and start a new one in five minutes? Or? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, probably a good idea. All right. Yeah.